chapter 5, here we go. The picture in front of you is, if I remember this correctly, um, the only picture taken, or, or the, only, uh, the only time that pictures were taken with uh, two of the great civil rights leaders, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., uh, they, they are kind of, they were, uh, they had different philosophies with respect to civil rights, but uh, a very famous picture, uh, nevertheless. Okay, so civil rights, what are they? What are they? Um, why uh, do we care so much about them, etc.? cetera? Um, so let me jump ahead one, uh, one slide, then we'll go back. Um, so civil rights are policies designed to protect people against arbitrary or discriminatory treatment by government officials or individuals. Now, it wasn't always or individuals, but it, in the United States, civil rights has come to mean that you have certain rights, um, even against individuals, which is a good thing. Um, you've got to treat people with dignity and respect. Um, that's really what is going on here. Um, and that the government cannot just arbitrarily take rights away. So where did this where did this civil rights movement begin? Now let me back back up just for a second. Um, the chapter lists a number of, of groups and 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 peoples, um, and it goes into their story of civil rights. Um, we will not cover all of those in the lectures. Um, there's just too many. You guys probably wouldn't want to listen to all of it anyway. But what you should understand about all of those is all of those other groups is they've basically taken the same approach um, that African Americans took to gain civil rights. Um, so we'll come back to that question um, as to how they did that um, after we're, we're done uh, going over the information on how African Americans gained civil rights. We'll, we'll return to that question. All right, so it all began, really, um, a, at least a, a massive protest began on December 1st, 1955. As you recall, um, this, this surely, this was not um, the first act of civil dif disobedience, um, this was not the first act of an organized effort to gain civil rights, but this is the one that really became the catalyst. So Rosa Parks refused um, to give up her seat to a white man. So in those days in the Deep South, if an individual uh, came onto a bus um, and uh, they were white and there were no seats left, they could request a black person to give up their seat. And so this white man comes onto the bus, no seats left. And so Rosa Parks sitting towards the front, he asked her, she, she, he asked her to give up her seat and she refused for which she was arrested. So you can see here, right here, this is her, her uh, uh, mug shot, um, her arrest. This is a picture taken years later to commemorate um, what she had done. Um, and really at the heart of what Rosa Parks was doing and at the heart of all all this civil rights struggle is, are all men, and we're talking men, we're of course talking um, humanity, men, women, children, whatever, um, are they created equal? Is that a reality? That is the heart of, of, of what the uh, civil uh, rights movement is all about. So, and it is, it is, they are. Now it's taken us some, some time to realize the American creed, but that is what is going on. Um, there are civil rights. The government cannot pe uh, treat people differently um, and arbitrarily take away those rights, nor can individuals. All right. So what are some conceptions of equality? If you let me, again, let me just jump ahead. So we believe this idea of, of equality. If you look at the 14th Amendment, um, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. So we can't do that. But what does equal what does equal protection mean? So there are a number of con there are, there are a couple concepts of what just does all men are created equal mean. 
Now, one view of that is this equality means equality of results or equality of rewards. And as you can see here, I've got a, a strike line through that. In, a, in the American system, we do not, by and large, there are, there are people who advocate for this, but by and large, in the United States, we do not take this, of, this as the view of equality. Um, we see we see the appropriate view of equality as equality of opportunity, not as equality of results. Um, this is very much a, a communist type of system, and we in America have rejected that. Um, we also um, see how it has not worked. Um, and so we believe in an equality of opportunity. Now, there are still those who advocate for that, but by and large, uh, Americans accept this idea of equality of opportunity, not as equality of results. So this idea, of course, um, comes from the 14th Amendment, as we just suggested. Um, for some individuals, this equality of opportunity or the fact that all men are created equal and deserve this equal protection of the laws has come uh, quicker than others. Um, you can see now, uh, depending on what group you find yourself in, um, you may feel that it has not come fast en enough for you. Um, but it's, you know, that's just how it works out. Ch uh, ch uh, change takes time. Change is incremental. Um, and at the time of the founding, it was only white men who voted. Um, after time, African Americans were given the right to vote, although they really couldn't um, they didn't have an effective right to vote until the 1960s. Um, nevertheless, um, change takes time. Um, when all white men were given the right to vote in, at the founding, um, the, the reality is that was an improvement over what it had been. Um, so so this, this, this idea of equality of, of results, this, or equality of opportunity, of, the, the fact that all men are created equal, it's not something that just happens overnight. Um, okay, so this 14th Amendment, the intent um, was to, to provide equal protection of the laws. And so you get this, this equal protection clause that we've already read here. Um, and to give the former slaves citizenship. That was the intent, to make them equal um, with other members of society. And so again, even though this is the intent, it doesn't mean it happens right away. You still got to change people's attitudes and beliefs, and that takes time. All right, so there's something known, you probably have heard this uh, phrase, invidious, invidious discrimination. And that is discrimination that, um, that works against person or groups that work to their harm and is based on animosity. So discrimination against persons or groups that works to their harm and is based on animosity. So definitely you can, you can see within this uh, concept of invidious discrimination um, that African Americans, uh, and again, there have been other groups, but African Americans um, have suffered this kind of discrimination, um, worked to their harm and been based on animosity. Let me give you um, uh, this little thing here. You've probably all heard of um, the rule of thumb. Let me just take that away for a second. So what does this rule of thumb mean? Oh, as a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb. You probably heard that expression. Well, what it originally meant was this. Um, you couldn't beat your wife with anything wider than your thumb. This was an English law that an end of, a husband could not beat their wife with anything wider than their thumb. Um, that's where it comes from. This was invidious discrimination. So you can see um, change has been incrementally and incrementally slow um, throughout history. Okay, so what has the Supreme Court done? So in looking, um, in looking at these cases that um, bring, this equal, uh, bring this idea of equal protection of the laws, this equality, um, the Supreme Court has different standards of review. Different standards of review. Let me jump ahead again. 
Um, so there's three standards of review, the rational basis, um, the intermediate scrutiny, and the strict scrutiny. So we're going to go back and look at all three of these and um, give you some examples. All right, so the rational basis test um, suggests that legislation must bear a rational relationship relationship to a legitimate government purpose. Okay, very easy test for the government to overcome. Um, the idea with the rational basis test is when, the, when a court looks at a piece of legislation based on this view, they presume the law is constitutional. They just, at the outset, it's, it's presumed to be constitutional. And the burden of proof is on the challenge to show that the class, classifications are not reasonable but are arbitrary. So, for example, here are some things that the rational basis test would look at. 16 years for a driver's license. Is that a, a reasonable or rational uh, relationship to a le legitimate government purpose? Um, or is that discriminatory? Are we discriminating, discriminating against 15 and 14 and 11 and 12, 13 year olds by doing this? And most of you would probably think, no, no, we're not. Um, maybe 16 is too young. So there is a rational ba basis for this government action. 21 years old to drink. Um, is this, does this have a rational relationship to a legitimate government purpose. And again, you could argue, yes, it does, or you might argue, no, it doesn't. You might say, well, you know what? 18 years old, if you're an adult, you're an adult. But here, in a sense, where drinking is concerned, you can argue that there is kind of a, a graduated adulthood. Uh, there, were, there were those, well, let me just go to the next one. 18 years old to vote. It used to be that you had to be 18 years old to vote. Um, but... But during the Vietnam War, um, individuals, young, young adults, were making the argument, if I am old enough to go out and die for my country, because you could be drafted at 18, um, if I'm old enough to go out and die for my country, then I ought to be able to be, then I ought to be old enough to vote for those who send me off to die. That um, became a persuasive argument. But ironically, it was not overturned at the court level, but legislation was passed, an amendment was passed, which um, changed the voting age from 21 to 18. So this is the rational basis test, um, that, that it's got to have a rational relationship to a legitimate government purpose. All right, the next one, it's called, it's, it's called intermediate scrutiny, um, and it its name suggests what it does. It's kind of a, it's a, an intermediate tier of, of how the court would look at legislation. Um, so legislation must bear a substantial relationship to an important governmental purpose. So when would that happen? When would the court look at something on this intermediate, intermediate scrutiny standard or with this intermediate scrutiny standard? And when it does that, or where there's issues of gender and illegitimacy. Um, so women being not having the same rights as men. Um, an illegitimate child not having the same rights as his legitimate counterparts. Um, these would be examples um, that would trigger intermediate, intermediate scrutiny by the court. Um, so one of those examples... Um, women in combat roles in the military. Should women be denied the right to have combat roles in the military? Uh, in the military? Um, and this, this young woman by the name of Jessica Lynch, she was in a combat role and, and she, got, um, she got taken prisoner. It was made national news and, and it was all the rage. Um, and and it, it, of course, brought out all sorts of issues. Um, for when, what should women's role be in the military and should um, they ser serve in the front lines? Um, how about this question? Men are eligible for the draft, but not women. Is that discriminatory on this intermediate scrutiny standard? Um, or is there a 
substantial relationship to an important governmental purpose. Um, and it's an interesting question. If men can be drafted, why can't women? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, but most people um, believe that it is men who should go out there and fight and not women. For, first of all, um, men can't repopulate the country if things go south. Um, so you see there is this idea, is there a substantial relationship to an important governmental purpose? Yes. Um, we need women to repopulate the country if, if, uh, if our military gets wiped out. Um, yeah, there you have it. There you have it. So that deals with gender equality, and it doesn't ever mean that there can't be, quote, what some might perceive as inequality, but it can also recognize that there, there are important distinctions, differences between men and women, and the court will take those into consideration when they uh, rule on legislation. And the third level of scrutiny is known as strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny. So... In this classification, um, it's the government is going to look at it as suspect. They are going to presume that when the court um, legislates based on race, ethnicity, national origin, or religion in any of these classifications, there's gonna. It's like they're going to assume that the legislation itself is up, um, is invalid. The government is going to have to find a compelling interest that there's no other way to accomplish the purpose of the law before the court will let this stand. So it's necessary, this classification, in order for it to stand, classification is necessary, necessary to accomplish a compelling government goal and is the least restrictive way to achieve a legitimate government objective. Um, so, so race, religion, um, national origin, these are all going to trigger strict, strict scrutiny. So going back to that chart where we were at, this is, this, is, this is the chart that identifies what is going on here. Here's the, the standard of review. Here's the basis of the classification, what, it, what is going to trigger one of these standards of review. Um, here is the standard itself, so with the rational basis test, it's a reasonless, reasonableness standard. Is there a reasonable relationship to a rational government objective? Okay, um, that's easy to meet, whereas the intermediate scrutiny is uh, moderately difficult to meet, and the inherently suspect is very difficult, uh, extremely difficult to meet. Um, let me give you one example. What one example where the government met that? So um, during World War II, um, when the United States was attacked by uh, Japan at Pearl Harbor in California, um, um, the government um, rounded up Japanese Americans and put them in internment camps. And one individual uh, sued arguing that this was a violation of their equal protection of laws. And the court, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, um, named the case was Korematsu versus the United States. And the court said that the government met this standard, um, that they, they saw no other way to, to where they could um, make certain that, that Americans were not sabotaged sabotaged um, without putting Japanese Americans into these internment camps. Now, clearly in our, in our day today, we would see that as racist. Um, but at the time, again, change takes place incrementally. Um, and that's, that's what happened. Today, that, that likely would not fly. Um, but that's what happened. There it is. All right. Um, Let's stop here and we'll pick up on a new uh, video with this one.